Hi everybody, uh, this video is going to be on section 9.4 which is vector differential equations and in particular we're going to be studying the case of non-defective coefficient matrix. Okay, so um, let's write down what we're considering here. We restrict our attention to the homogeneous vector differential equation of the form, and we're going to call this guy star, and this differential equation looks like this. x prime of t is equal to a times x of t, where a has real constants. i.e. what this means is that a is just a matrix of constants. It is not a function. Okay, this is a special case, right? This, is, this does not represent the general case, but we're doing just constant coefficients for a. So I want you to recall that we actually did already solve a problem like this, but we did it using another method, right? Um, we did it using kind of a method that involved elimination. Um, we're not going to be using that method, but I just want to cite that example so we can look at what the solutions look like, okay? So in an earlier example, we solved the differential equation system. Now, um, if you recall, this was section 9.1. We solved this, right? But this is the same as x prime is equal to 1, 2, 2, negative 2 times x. Okay, so this is the system form, and this is vector form. Okay, we solved this differential equation, all right? And here is what we got for the answer, okay? So our solution... was x1 was e to the negative 3t, negative 2 e to the negative 3t, and x, so actually, let me write it out in component form, right? What we actually got is that x1 was c1 e to the negative 3t, plus c2 e to the 2t, and x2 is equal to c1 times negative 2 e to the negative 3t, plus c2 over 2 e to the 2t. But what we can actually do is write it in this form. Now look, x1 actually equals this, right? or not x1, sorry. So sorry, I wrote this wrong. These are not vectors, right? These are just the regular old x1 of t and x2 of t, as written in my original differential equations, right? In the system form. So this, this is the solutions written in system form. How would you write that in vector form, though? So let me, write, let me rewrite this in a nice way, okay? If I were to write this as a general solution, then we could think of x of t as being 
c1 e to the negative 3t plus c2 e to the 2t, and then negative 2 c1 e to the negative 3t plus 1 half c2 e to the 2t, right? But this is the same as, and I want to show you guys how it's possible to write this, okay? So if we were to split this up into the sum of two linearly independent solutions, it actually looks like this, right? Um, wouldn't this become C1 times, I can pull out an e to the negative 3t, and then what I'm left with is a vector 1, negative 2, plus, and then if I write C2, e to the 2t, what I'm left with is the vector 1, 1 half, okay? So you could think of these two guys as being your two linearly independent solutions. This is x1 of t, and this is x2 of t, okay? So I want us to notice something about our two vector solutions here. So notice that both vector solutions are of the same form, right? Aren't they of the form e to the lambda t times a vector, right? So both of them are of that form. So the question is, is this always the case? And if not, then when? In other words, is it always the case? And if not, then when is it the case? Okay. So I want us to think about this a little bit. There's a reason I use the lambda there, and what's really cool is this is about to connect to something that we studied in chapter 7, okay? The idea of the eigenvalue and eigenvector problem. So I want us to suppose that x prime is equal to ax has... the solution x equals e to the lambda t times v. So let's suppose that this is actually a solution, right? Um, so what we're going to do is differentiate it then and plug it in. So what would x prime be? Well, um, we know how to take the derivative of that. v is a constant, right? So this would just be lambda e to the lambda t times v, right? So what would that give us? So if that is a solution, given that this is a solution, that means that this is on the left side, and a times this would be on the right side. So this would tell us that lambda e to the lambda t v has to equal a times x, which is e to the lambda t v, okay? What does this mean? Well, if you divide both sides by e to the lambda t, you end up with lambda times v is equal to a times v. What does this mean? This should look familiar to you guys. This is exactly what it means for A has eigenvalue lambda with corresponding eigenvector V. So what does this mean? So this proves the following. So this proves the 
the following theorem. So let's write down this theorem. Let A be an n by n matrix with real constants. So I'm going to write it this way. Let A be an n by n matrix with real constants. And suppose that A has eigenvalue lambda with corresponding eigenvector v, then x equals e to the lambda t times v is a solution to the vector differential equation x prime is equal to a times x. So if a has eigenvalue value lambda with eigenvector v, then x is equal to e to the lambda t. v is a solution, okay? So this guy right here, if you know an eigenvalue and an eigenvector, that has to be a solution. So then, can we find all solutions this way? Well, we know that this is only going to be possible if A has n eigenvalues corresponding to n eigenvectors, right? So this leads us to the following theorem. Again, let A be an M by sorry, an N by N matrix with real coefficients. If A is non-defective, remember what non-defective means? It has N eigenvalues, lambda 1 to lambda n, I'm going to say counting repetitions, because sometimes they have multiplicities, right? And with corresponding linearly independent eigenvectors v1 all the way to vn then e to the lambda 1 t times v1 e to the lambda 1 t times v2 all the way down to e to the lambda n t times v n. These guys right here are n linearly independent solutions to x prime is equal to a times x. And thus, the general solution is x of t is equal to c1, e to the lambda 1 t v1, plus c2, e to the lambda 2 t times v2, plus cn, e to the lambda n t times v so this is how you find the general solution. Okay, so every single, um, every single thing that we do in this section is going to be with only non-defective matrices A, because of course, if A is defective, 
then it's not going to have n linearly independent eigenvectors, so this method will not produce enough solutions. So um, those require more advanced techniques that we're actually not going to cover um, in this section. Okay. Now, of course, um, the proof of this, it's actually uh, quite simple. Um, I mean, we already showed that these were solutions in the, before we even wrote the theorem down. So the real question is, are these linearly independent? Um, it's actually quite simple. I'm going to just write it down. It just takes a line here. So proof, we need to show that they are linearly independent, okay? So what would the Ronskin be of e to the lambda 1 t v1 all the way to e to the lambda n t times vn of t? Remember, this is just the determinant of... You put these all as columns, right? So e to the lambda 1 t v1, e to the lambda 2 t times v2, and then e to the lambda n t times vn. This is an n by n matrix that we are trying to take the determinant of, right? Now remember the way determinants work is you can actually pull something out of a row and it gets multiplied, or a column, and it gets multiplied by the whole determinant, right? So wouldn't this become, um, I could pull out the e to the lambda i t's and then they all get multiplied together on the outside, which means the exponents get added. So you get e to the lambda 1 plus you add up all the eigenvalues, lambda 2, or sorry, lambda n, and then t. And then what's left is going to be the determinant of just v1 all the way to vn, right? These are your columns now. But hold on a minute. This is e to the something, and e to the something is never 0. And what about these guys? Well, remember, we were assuming that these were n linearly independent eigenvectors. And so, of course, if you put n linearly independent things in a matrix, their determinant cannot be 0, right? And so this entire thing is not equal to 0. So since the Ronskin was not equal to 0, they are linearly independent. Okay, in other words, we have a complete set of solutions. So this is great because we have basically turned a vector differential equation problem into just a problem of finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which we already know how to do. Okay, so very cool. We're using linear algebra to solve differential equations. Let's do an example. Let's find the general solution to x1 prime is equal to 2x1 plus x2, and x2 prime is equal to negative 3x1 minus 2x2. So let's go ahead and first put it into vector form, okay? This is x prime is equal to, so the matrix 2, 1, negative 3, negative 2, and then x. Okay, so this is our coefficient um, matrix. So in other words, a is equal to 2, negative 3, 1, negative 2, right? And so we want to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. So let's go ahead and write down the characteristic polynomial, right? This is going to be the determinant of A minus lambda I. So it's going to be the determinant of 2 minus lambda, negative 3, 
1, and then negative 2 minus lambda, right? So if you take that determinant, you end up with negative 4 plus lambda squared plus 3. Um, so wait, like negative 4... Um, Yeah, equals, this is the same as lambda squared minus 1, which implies that lambda is equal to plus or minus 1. We got two eigenvalues, right? So we know that this is going to be non-defective, right? Because we already have two eigenvalues, and each one's going to have its own eigenvector. So let's go ahead and call these. Lambda 1 is going to be negative 1. Lambda 2 is going to be 1. So now we're going to find the eigenvectors. So for lambda 1 is equal to negative 1, um, we're going to look at a plus i sharp. And so this is going to become 3, 1, negative 3, negative 1, and then 0, 0. So in just in order to save time here, when you do row operations to this, you end up with the following. 1, 1 third, 0, and then 0, 0, 0. Okay, so what this means is if you were to call Maybe I'll just use the letter y here, okay? So if we make y2 our free variable, and um, because t is already being used to mean something else here, let me just use r as our free variable, then that means that y1 is equal to negative one-third r. And so we end up with uh, r times negative one-third comma one, what we can know, we can clear the fractions of this. If we multiply this by 3, we get negative 1, 3. Okay. Um, so this right here is our first eigenvector. Let me write it down this way. Okay. Let's find our second eigenvector now. For lambda 2... For lambda 2 equals um, positive 1, right, then we are solving uh, a minus i sharp, or augmented, right? And so we just take away 1. We end up with 1, 1, negative 3, negative 3, 0, 0. And already in one step, if you just add... 3 times row 1 to row 2, we get 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so this means if we let y2 be r, then y1 is going to be negative r. So this leads us to the eigenvector negative 1, 1. Okay? So this means that v2, the second eigenvector, is negative 1, 1. Okay, so now that we have the two eigenvectors and eigenvalues, we can write down our two solutions. Okay, so by the theorem, x1 is equal to, remember, it's the first eigenvalue, e to the lambda 1 t v1, which is the same as e to the negative t times the vector negative 1, 3. Okay. What would x2 be? Same concept, right? x2 is equal to e to the lambda 2. Let me write it out. Lambda 2t v2, which is just e to the t, and then negative 1, 1. So these are the two linearly independent solutions. Okay, and so we can write down the general solution then is x is equal to c1 e to the negative t, negative 1, 3, plus c2 e to the t, negative 1, 
1. So this would be in, we could combine this. We could combine this into one single vector, negative c1 e to the negative t minus c2 e to the t, and then 3c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the t. If you wanted to write them as scalar functions, you could do that. Remember we started off with x1 and x2, so you could write it this way. The first solution, x1 of t, is negative c1 e to the negative t minus c2 e to the t, and then x2 of t is equal to 3c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the t, right? This would be our scalar functions, and this would be in vector form. Okay, so um, this is a nice way to solve these problems um, using nothing but eigenvalues and eigenvector theory that we learned in chapter 7. Let's do another example. So, another example. Let's solve the following. x prime is equal to a times x, where a is equal to the following matrix. 0, negative 2, negative 2, 2, 4, 2, negative 3, negative 3, negative 1. So this is a 3 by 3. Um, computationally, this will be a bit uh, more difficult, but it's not going to be um, harder conceptually, right? So let's go ahead and let's find P of lambda, right? We want to find the characteristic polynomial. Remember that that's going to be the determinant of, just subtract lambda from all of the diagonals, right? So we have that, we have that, and we have that, okay? So uh, what happens? We get the following, negative lambda times, um, we have the determinant of 4 minus lambda, negative 3, 2, negative 1 minus lambda, minus 2, times the determinant of 2, negative 3, 2, and then negative 1 minus lambda, and then minus 3, times the determinant of negative 2, negative 2, 4 minus Oh, sorry, I wrote this wrong. You know what? I was expanding on a different column. Um, let me do the other column. Actually, what I want to do is I want to expand on this guy right here, okay? And I think that's what I meant to do. So this should be a positive 2, actually. So positive 2, and then uh, we got that matrix. And then, sorry, this last one should be minus, minus 2. So it's going to be minus 2. Um, and we have left um, 2 minus 3, 4 minus lambda, and then minus 3. Okay? I don't want to uh, waste time doing all the algebra. I mean, I recommend doing it carefully. And what we end up with is the following. Okay? We end up with lambda plus 1 lambda minus 2 squared. Okay, so we do actually get uh, only two eigenvalues, okay? So we're going to say, and I'm going to actually um, label them as 1, 2, and 3. So lambda 2 I'm going to call 2, and lambda 3 I'm also going to call 2. So again, we have multiplicity 2 with 
the with the eigenvalue of two, okay, but I'm gonna label them as one, two, and three because remember we need to get three vectors out of this, okay? So let's go ahead and find the eigenvectors. Let's start with lambda one, okay? So with lambda one equaling negative one, we're going to take A and we're going to add the identity matrix to it. And let's see what we get. We end up with one, negative two, negative two, two, five, two, negative three, negative three, zero, and then zero, zero, zero. Okay, after a lot of work, um, you can get it to look like this. One, zero, negative one, zero, zero, one, negative one, zero, 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 zero. Okay, and so uh, what do we get for our answer here? Um, we only have one free variable, right? Y3, let's let that be R. This means Y2 ends up being R. Y1 is also R. So we end up getting one, one, one. So this means that our first eigenvector is one, one, one. Okay, let's go with the next one now. We're gonna do lambda two is equal to two. So again, we do a minus two i and we do the augmented matrix there and we end up, uh, we take away two from every diagonal element here and we get negative two, two, negative three. And then we get two, negative three, negative two, negative three, and negative two, two. Okay, so, um, Let's see what happens. I mean, we can already see that each row um, is a multiple of the first, right? And so, again, if you do work on this, it's not that hard. All you have to do is add the negative row 1 to both rows 2 and 3, and then multiply row 1 by negative a half. But let me just go ahead and write the answer down. We get 1, negative 1, 3 halves, and then 0, 0, 0 and then the rest are zeros. Two free variables, this is great because we know this is gonna to amount to two more eigenvectors, okay? So let's go ahead and um, we need two free variables, y2 is r and y3 is s. So what does y1 equal? It equals r minus three halves s, right? r minus three halves s. So what does this give us? This gives us r times 1, 1, 0 plus s times um, negative 3 halves, 0, 1, right? So this is what I got. Um, and remember, any linear uh, combination of either one of these, any multiple of these works as well, right? Because S is any number. And so we can actually clear out the fractions by multiplying the one on the right by two. So this gives us two more eigenvectors. We're gonna say V2 is vector one, one, zero. And V3 is equal to negative three, zero, two. So we actually do get a complete set of eigenvectors, right? In other words, A is non-defective, okay? So we've got three eigenvectors, and we got the three eigenvalues, so we're ready to write down our general solution. So general solution. So X is gonna equal, we know it's gonna be C1 and remember, the first eigenvalue was negative 1, so e to the negative t. And then our first eigenvector, 1, 1, 1, plus c2, and then e to the 2t, because 2 was the second eigenvalue, and then 1, 1, 0, and then plus c3, also e to the 2t, except this one was a different eigenvalue, right? This one was negative 3, 0, 2. 
Um, we can write these as three scalar functions if we want to. Uh, the first one's going to be c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the 2t minus 3c3 e to the 2t. And then x2 is equal to c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the 2t. We do not need a c3 because it's 0 there, right? And then x3 is going to equal c1 e to the negative t. And we can just jump to c3, right? 2 c3 e to the 2 t. So these would be the scalar functions. If we want to write them out as scalar functions, we can or vector form is right above, okay? These are just two different ways of writing the same answer. Okay, so we have done uh, cases where the eigenvalues are real, okay? But now let's talk about complex eigenvalues because we know that that results in slightly different forms, right? We need to consider that. Okay, so what if some so what if we get some complex eigenvalues? Okay. So as we can imagine, in this case, we can still determine real valued solutions. But it is going to take a little bit of development, okay? It's not completely obvious, all right? So um, first things first is we need a lemma, okay? If we get a solution that has a real and an imaginary part. So let's suppose that this and x2 of t is equal to the complex conjugate. Let's suppose that these two functions, these are complex valued solutions to x prime is equal to a x then r of t and s of t are real valued Now let me just be clear, we're saying that these guys are also solutions, but they are real valued as well, right? Because I'm not putting any i's in there. So these are also solutions to um, x prime is equal to ax, okay? So what would be the proof of this? Well, the proof is that um, I mean, it's, it's actually quite simple here. If you were to take x1 and x2, look, I want you guys to look at these two equations up here. I want you to notice something. If you add these two together, what would x1 of t plus x2 of t equal? If you add them together, aren't you going to get 2r of t? So if you add these together and you divide by 2, this is equal to r of t, so that guy has to be a solution. Why? Because it's the linear combination of two solutions. And how can we get s of t from this? Well, what if we take x1 and we subtract x2? Well, then the r's cancel, and we're left with 2s of ti, and all we have to do now is divide that by 2i, 
and that gives us s of t. So now that guy is a solution. Okay, and both are real valued. Why is this a lemma? Because we are not done yet, right? We still need to figure out what R and S actually are that we're talking about, okay? We need to actually find what these solutions are. So, I want us to suppose for a second that lambda is equal to a plus bi is an eigenvalue, okay, with eigenvector v. And let's suppose that V has a real and an imaginary part, R plus S I. Okay? Real part and an imaginary part. What would be the solutions? Well, I want to show uh, you guys what these solutions would be, okay? If we were to apply the same logic as before, it would have to be E to the lambda T times um, R plus S I, okay? So what would that be? Well, we know that this first guy is really E to the lambda T, remember, is E to the A plus B I T, right? And then we still have R plus S I. But what is e to the a plus b i t? Okay, we know that this is exactly e to the a t times cosine of b t. Plus i sine b t. And that's just the first part, right? That's just this underlined part is this and so we still have r plus s i here okay so in other words we have to sit here and distribute this so what do we actually get if we distribute this we get the following e to the a t times cosine of b t R minus e to the a t sine of b t times s plus, and then we get e to the a t sine of b t r plus e to the a t cosine of b t s okay and all of that times i okay so all we did here is we basically just multiplied this times this and remember that i squared is equal to negative one so i essentially foiled right and i got all of that okay but by the lemma since this becomes my ultimate solution remember these two guys have to be the real valued solutions, right? Because what we said, look at the lemma, right? The lemma says that if we have solutions R of T plus S of T I, then the real and imaginary part themselves form the solutions. And so these are the solutions. So this leads us to the big theorem that allows us to deal with complex numbers. The theorem says, if a matrix A has complex eigenvalue, A plus BI with corresponding
eigenvector V, which is R plus IS, then two real valued, not only real valued, but linearly independent solutions to x prime is equal to a x r x1 of t is equal to e to the a t times cosine of b t r minus sine of b t s and x2 of t is equal to e to the a t times sine of b t r plus cosine of b t s. These are the two real valued solutions, okay? So what is the conclusion now with this theorem? We can now solve any vector differential equation of the form x prime is equal to ax where a is non-defective. It's important, right? a has to be non-defective otherwise we don't have enough eigenvectors to um, use that to build our solutions, okay? So let's go ahead and do an example using complex numbers so we can at least see one, right? So example, I want us to solve the following. x prime is equal to ax, where a is equal to 2, 2, negative 1, 4. All right, guys, so I'm going to write down the characteristic polynomial P of lambda, and this is going to be the determinant of, remember, you subtract lambda from the diagonals, you get 2 minus lambda, 2, negative 1, 4 minus lambda. This ends up being lambda squared minus 6 lambda plus 10, and we set that equal to 0, right? So we use the quadratic formula because that does not factor. We end up with negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So that's 40 all over 2a. So this is going to equal 6 plus or minus 2i all over 2, which is the same as 3 plus or minus i. So we've got our two eigenvalues, right? We know that they are complex conjugates. Okay, um, we need to find the other eigenvector, or sorry, the eigenvectors now that go with these, right? So um, let's just find one. Remember, you only really need one because the theorem, we already know that the complex conjugate is going to be the other, and uh, it doesn't matter anyway because our theorem above tells us what to do as soon as we have one, right? So um, let's find an eigenvector now. So we're going to let lambda 1 equals uh, 3 plus i. Let's do this one first, right? Um, if we do that, we end up with, um, I'm going to do, uh, remember, you're going to subtract that away from the diagonal. So if we do a minus lambda 1 times the identity, and you augment it, Here's what you get. We're going to do to subtract that, we get negative 1 minus i, negative 1, and then 2, and then 4. Oh, sorry, wait. 4 minus, so it would be 1 minus i, right? So 1 minus i. And then we have 0, 0. 
Well, what I would do here, because we have a two there, I would go ahead and flip the first and second row. So we're left with two, one minus i, zero, and then negative one minus i, negative one, and then zero, right? And then we would multiply row one by a half. And that's gonna become one, and then one half minus one half i, and then zero. And I'm also gonna do the two by two trick because we have a two by two trick and we know that the bottom row is gonna be all zeros. That's because you always need at least one row of zeros when you are doing any eigenvalue problem. So with once you have your row echelon, your one, just turn the second guy into a, a row of zeros, okay? So we have a free variable. Y2 is gonna be R. What's Y1 gonna be? Um, I suppose maybe I shouldn't use R just because we already are using R as a different thing, right? So let me just create a different variable. Um, how about, uh, I don't think we're using U, U for anything. So maybe I'll call Y2 equal to U. And what's Y1 equal to? Um, it's gonna be negative one half plus one half i times u. So what's my eigenvector gonna be? I have two eigenvectors, right? V1 is equal to, um, remember any combination of that so I can double it to clear the fractions, I get negative one plus i comma one. And then the other guy, of course, is gonna be the complex conjugate. So it's gonna be negative one minus i one. Remember, you always flip the imaginary part, the sign of the imaginary part. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, I forgot. I have to double, right? Because um, if I double one, I have to double the other because it's uh, the same u is being used for both. So this should be a two here, right? I doubled it to clear the fractions, okay? So I've got my, so look guys, the, these are my eigenvalues. These are my eigenvalues. This is my A and this is my, my. so my A is three and my B is one, right? A plus B I. And then these are my eigenvectors. And remember the eigenvectors are of the form, uh, my eigenvectors are of the form R plus I S, right? So let's go ahead and write those out because it's good to see, okay? So this means that V1, V1 is equal to, remember, V1 was negative one plus I and then two, right? If we write this in column vector form, it looks like this. So I can write it like this, real part plus I times the imaginary vector part. Okay, so this is R and this is my S vector. Okay, and I have my A plus B I, right? My A plus B I was, remember, it's three plus one I, right? So lambda is equal to three plus one I. And this is my A, this is my B. Okay, and so we're ready to write down the formula. According to my formula up there, um, I end up with the following. X1 is equal to e to the at, so that's uh, e to the 3t. By the way, let me just go ahead and, and, and write out um, the entire, no, I don't have to re-derive it, it's okay. Understand we're just using the formula from the theorem, okay? So it's gonna be e to the three t times cosine of bt, so in this case that's cosine of t times r, there's r, uh, minus sine of t times s. So that's our first uh, real solution. And our second real solution 
is equal to e to the 3t, and then we have sine of t times r, and then plus cosine of t times s. Okay? So, um, this guy is the same as if I were to write it in a nicer way, it looks like this e to the 3t times negative cos t minus sine t, and then um, the bottom just gives us 2 cosine t. And then this guy is e to the 3t times, we get negative sine t plus cosine t, and then this is 2 sine t. Finally, our general solution is x of t is equal to c1 times the first. So it's going to be c1 times this guy. plus c2 times, let me put it on the next line because stuff is getting a little messy here, plus c2 times e to the 3t, and then negative sine t plus cosine t, um, and then 2 sine t. This is my general solution to the vector differential equation. Of course, if you wrote it all out, you could even maybe combine some stuff here, um, but uh, this is the general solution that you're going to use. Okay, um, If you don't remember that formula, you can still proceed, understand that, okay? For example, in this problem, if I had forgotten the formula, this is what I would have written. I would have written e to the 3 plus i times... And then remember, my eigenvector was, um, so my first eigenvector, yeah, negative 1 plus i and then 2, right? So this is what I had. And then remember the formula. This means I can write this, oh, sorry, this is a t here, right? And so this becomes e to the 3t times cosine of t plus i sine t, and then... I have negative 1 plus i, 2, okay? From here, you could just multiply everything out, and then um, once you get something plus i times something, then these become your two solutions. This becomes your x1, and this becomes your x2, and you basically just ignore you ignore this guy, okay? You ignore the i. So if you forget your formula, not all hope is lost, okay? But you do need to understand this guy, right? That this and this are the same thing, okay? So you can't get away from knowing that. And that just boils down to the fact that, um, you know, e to the a plus bi is always equal to e to the a times cosine b plus i sine b. This is just a formula, right, that we need to remember about complex numbers. If you understand that formula, then you are able to just come up with this answer on your own without memorizing that giant formula. But if you can memorize this theorem, then it will serve you, can get things done a little bit quicker. That's all. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope the video was helpful.